So I'd like to pick up a little bit on a thread that we touched on last night about similarities and differences in the way that different traditions describe the path and progress on the path. So oftentimes what you hear about Zen is Zen says to progress on the path. Bah humbug. Just make the big leap. And that, that, that's a certain kind of rhetoric that's intended to encourage people. Uh, but I brought a little story today that I hope to share that to illustrate a little bit more nuance around the way that that happens and how it actually perhaps is more similar to uh, some of the early Buddhist teachings than you might think. So the story I want to tell you is a little bit of the story of the sixth Zen ancestor. The sixth Zen ancestor is Wei Nung. He was, uh, and still is, I would say, one of the most uh, respected and revered teachers in Chinese Chan tradition, which later became uh, Japanese Zen, evolved into, into Japan. And, uh, and the legend of his practice, uh, the legend of his life, is told in a book called the Platform Sutra, which rightly said is not actually a sutra. Right? That's a different way of understanding that word. But in any event, that's the title of the book. And it's platform because it's the, the foundation of the Chan understanding of the path. So in the story of the Platform Sutra, we hear a little bit about how Wei Nang came to be the ancestor of the fifth, the, the successor to the fifth ancestor, Hongren. And, um, It basically, the way that the story is told is he, he wrote a poem that described the nature of reality so well, better than any of the other couple of hundred monks who lived in the fifth ancestor's monastery. Better than the head monk of that <coughs> monastery, in fact. And so in the middle of the night, he was called into the abbot's room, into Hongren's private quarters, and given the transmission of the succession. And he, previous to that, wasn't even ordained. He was, he was uh, a kitchen worker. He was illiterate. He'd come up from the south for various reasons. He, he grew up very poor, and, um, and then overnight he was named the successor. So a lot of people were really indignant, like really angry. So having kind of imagined this, predicted this, um, the fifth ancestor said, please go away, go for a long walk for three years. <laughs> and, um, and don't come back because people, people need time to absorb this news. But many of his fellow monks were so indignant about this change, so upset about this change, that they went after him. And in particular, there was one monk named Wei Ming. Wei Ming. And 
Wei Ming was had been in the army before this. He was he was a warrior, and um, and kind of a rough and tumble fellow, as the story goes. And so he, because of his military skills, actually probably caught up with Wei Shun for uh, with Wei Nong first. He caught up with the new ancestor first of the group of folks that had set out after him. And so that's where the koan begins. The koan begins when Hong, uh, Wei Nang, who is the new sixth ancestor, is confronted by his Dharma brother, Wei Ming. And so, The Sixth Ancestor starts out with a very profound teaching, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on that, but he's, he sees his Dharma brother coming, and he says, he says, you know, this robe symbolizes faith, so why fight over it? You could just have it. Because he knows that it's not the robe that makes him the ancestor, right? any more than it's my robe that makes me a practitioner or what you're wearing that makes you what you are. And so in that moment, as the koan goes, Wei Meng stops. He can't pick up the robe, actually. He says, it says he tried, and it's immovable. <laughs> but, and then it says, in fear, he asks, he says, actually, I've not come for the robe. I've come for the Dharma. Please give me a teaching. So then his, his years of practice are starting to show, right? He allows that fear that he's feeling and this, this encounter to stop him, to, to um, make him turn and think more deeply about how to respond in this situation. And so, Wei Nang gives him this answer. He says, without thinking good or bad, right now, in this very moment, what is your original face? That's the teaching he gives him. So it's a three-part pointer. Without thinking good or bad, so coming from the place of setting down your judgments, coming from the place of meeting what's here right now in this very moment. That's the second part of the pointer, right? Does this sound uh, familiar, folks? Does this sound like what we talked about in terms of mindfulness, in terms of bringing your presence, your attention to the moment, this kind of bare, right? Sounds familiar. What is your original face? So what is this thing, this life, without your identity, without some idea about what your clothes or your name or your rank mean? Independent of all that, what's actually going on here? So I think that also sounds pretty familiar in the context of what we've been talking about. And he asks him, he's asking him in the form of a question to elicit this kind of curiosity, this kind of investigation that is helpful on the path, some of the tools we talked about yesterday. So it's said in the koan that Wei Meng is very moved. He's moved to tears. And he says, in response to his Dharma brother, his now his boss, his teacher, he says, not that boss and teacher are the same thing, but in the case of being in a monastery, it's actually, it actually works a little bit like that. Um, he says, 
is there some esoteric meaning to what you just said? Like, did I get the decoder ring? <laughs> right? This word esoteric means like secret or hidden. You know, he's like, is there some mystery here that you could solve for me? So funny, huh? So he went from trying to get this special robe to now like trying to get this special secret mystery teaching. Same problem, right? Same, same dynamic in a way. And so immediately correcting this understanding, Wainan says to him, the, the kernel of the koan, he says, what I have just told you is not esoteric, it is not hidden, it is not secret. If you turn your attention, you will find that that is in, within you. It is within you. So Wenang isn't saying, oh, you know, everything's fine and there's no need to practice. He's giving him a very specific kind of practice instruction about how to work with his mind. And about the direction for that. So don't be fooled into thinking that the two are at odds. That the aspect that says, you are fully endowed with the Dharma, you are fully an expression of Dharma, is somehow different or separate from the aspect that says, and we need to practice the path. There is such a thing as progress on the path. There is such a thing as putting the conditions in place, cultivating a mind and body that can realize that fact, that basic human endowment that we have. So that's an introduction to talking a little bit more specifically about um, how the Buddha talked about the path. He talked about, gave us a number of different frameworks, many, many different frameworks, um, one of which I mentioned a little bit yesterday. So I want to go a little bit further into that. Um, So we, and to, just to recap a little bit, so we started by talking a little bit about some of the tools that are helpful in terms of practice, like mindfulness, like finding your place in your seat, like leading an ethical life, some of the basic conditions. So I want to talk more about other conditions that can unfold that can we can work toward cultivating in our life. And in order to do that, I'm going to work from this these um, as I said before, there's this, a series, there are about four uh, parallels it does, maybe five, um, that describe this kind of uh, path of practice unfolding to complete liberation, starting with leading a virtuous life and unfolding all the way to complete liberation. So, and as I said, there's, there are a couple of versions and one version is where Ananda is asking the questions, right? So we talked about Ananda asked the question of why live a virtuous life? What's the benefit of that or the purpose of that? And the Buddha responds, freedom from remorse. So, um, so that's the first that's the first step in this particular sutta so I'm going to work off of not the one in which Ananda is asking the questions but the next one after that 11.2 and Guttar 11.2 um, in which the Buddha is simply stating the progress so he says it this way or at least it's translated this way. Um, this is the Sujato, Ajahn Sujato's translation. There's also a translation by Tanisaro on the Sutta Central site. 
um, and probably on the Access to Insight site, and there's Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation in here if you're curious about it. But um, yeah. So he says, mendicants and equally I would say practitioners. An ethical person who has fulfilled ethical conduct need not make a wish. Or I like also the way the Bhikkhu Bodhi translates it is, need not exert their volition. Right. So practice is neither of those things. We're not making a wish that somehow magically we are going to become enlightened beings. And nor are we, by some process of our mental capacity, or some process of the force of will, creating that condition. So what is it? There's something else besides those two extremes. An ethical person who has fulfilled ethical conduct need not make a wish, may I have no regrets. It is only natural, or it is only the na- it's, it's in the nature of things that an ethical person has no regrets, feels no remorse about their behavior. And then moving on from that, You need not make a wish, may I feel joy. It's in the nature of things that a person who's free from remorse feels joy. So it's a particular kind of joy, I think I mentioned this before, there's a word called pamoja in uh, Pali. And that that kind of joy is the joy of uh, sort of enjoying the goodness in your life. when you reflect on living a bright life, then this kind of joy arises. And so, I wanna read you another passage related to that, because again, we might think, it's kind of an unusual thing to think. Oh yeah, you know, this is kind of like the pat yourself on the back teaching. Like really, it's helpful, it's a helpful practice to reflect on the goodness that you're doing in and particularly supporting the unfolding of Dhamma in your own life and other people's lives. It's actually helpful for your progress on the path. So I want to read to you a little quote of the Buddha telling Mahanama about why this is true. He says, you should recollect your own virtuous behavior praised by the wise, leading to concentration. When a noble practitioner recollects their virtuous behavior, on that occasion their mind is not obsessed by greed, hatred, or delusion. And on that occasion their mind is simply straight based on this virtuous behavior. So they gain inspiration in the meaning, gain inspiration in the Dhamma, gain joy connected with the Dhamma. So, in other words, when you're reflecting on the goodness in your life, it's keeping you out of trouble, for one. (laughs) It's keeping you from unwholesome mind states. And it's pleasant, it's uplifting. It helps to clarify the mind again, because it's, it's uplifting. So then, moving on to this next part, we have, and when you feel joy, you need not make a wish, may I experience joyful interest. Sometimes this word pitti is translated as rapture, which sounds really odd to me. But um, I suppose it's true in the sense that it is another kind of joy, but it's, and it's a very, it can be a very intensely energized kind of joy, like on the verge of unpleasant actually sometimes, <laughs> um, pitti. So there's, there is, um, but it's not a feeling, it's not a vedana, like pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral itself. 
it is it is a particular kind of joyful engagement with a, a mind that is connected to a particular object that's going on. So here we're starting to notice a shift, right? We're starting to notice a shift from, as, and as far as I know, most of the time, if not all the time, PT is associated with meditative states. Um, we're noticing a shift from our day-to-day -day activities and how we're conducting ourselves in the world toward how we're engaging in our practice on the cushion or our practice in walking meditation or a more formal kind of practice. Okay? So, so pitti arises one of the seven factors of enlightenment. So another really wholesome kind of state, another state which clearly is helpful, is conducive on the path. And then it says, when your mind is full of joyful interest, you need not declare an act of volition. May my body be calm, may my body be tranquil. So that kind of joy and that kind of clarity in the mind uplifting in the mind can relax the body too this is not this is pretty intuitive right we know that the body tends to cling to uh, difficulty you get tight right when the mind is constrained oftentimes the body is also very constrained in fact sometimes it goes the other way you notice the constraint in the body before you start to notice how the mind is constrained so the opposite is also true. And when, the, when the mind becomes more open, when the mind becomes more clarified, then there can be more relaxation in the body. So a kind of opening, a kind of, a kind of more flow. And that is conducive to, uh, that conduces to sukha, to sometimes translated as bliss. It can be kind of bliss to have a, a little bit more physical kind of joy, a, a, a lower in tone, but a lot lower in tone than PT, so much more relaxed. Um, not the end point, not the end point, I should say. Sometimes people get really uh, attached to being blissed out. <laughs> that can happen too. Um, it's pleasant, but. Don't get stuck there. Um, but notice that, so already the Buddha's talked about three different kinds of joyful, pleasant <coughs> states. Right? And we haven't even gotten to the concentration part yet. <laughs> so really think about this. Really think about the fact that although Buddhism can be... Um, very stern in some ways, right? And we talk about suffering, and we talk about death, and we talk about grief, and different kinds of ways that we make mayhem in our lives. But there's also this aspect of joy is conducive to the path. Joy can be very helpful. And it can arise out of our practice of meditation. So, so if you start to see that happening, then again, and to kind of rejoice in that, really savor that. You know, really savor that. And if you don't, then think about what are some of the conditions that you can put into place that might help that. Whether it's getting into. Uh, buying yourself a new meditation cushion, or um, maybe noticing how you're trying to force a particular state of mind, right? So you can't force joy either, or force any kind of progress on the path. So maybe backing off a little bit, 
this is this is a little bit of the creativity of response that we find within our practice, particularly your sitting practice. No matter what kind of method you're using, I would say this kind of sensitivity to the states that are arising and, and, our, and our responsiveness within that in terms of the, the energy, how the energy is applied, how the attention is applied, that's part of the work. That's part of a uh, skill that you can develop, you can cultivate over time. Right, so we talked about bliss. And then, when you feel sukha, when you feel this um, more calm state of joy in the body and, and mind, then you need not make a wish, may my mind become immersed in samadhi. May the mind become immersed in samadhi. So, so this word samadhi, various translations of it, um, kind of broadly stated, it's a composure of mind, it's a collectedness of mind. Um, and more specifically, sometimes it's translated as concentration. And the reason is, uh, one reason is because in my experience and some of the ways that I've seen it taught is there there could be three main kinds of samadhi that you would experience. So one kind of samadhi is a kind of flow. It means applying the mindfulness to the point where there's a composure of being able to follow the flow of experience. Sometimes Gil um, Pranso said what a, a metaphor that he likes to give is like Instead of being on the boats in the river, you actually get off the boat and sit on the bank of the river and watch the boats go by. So that's a little bit of the samadhi of the flow of stepping back from thoughts and letting thoughts be. Sometimes you hear like clouds in the sky. So it requires a little bit, you notice that it requires a little bit of non-identification. It requires you to step back and realize that you are not those things. Those are just mental objects. And then it's natural when your mind is immersed in samadhi to know and see things as they truly are. I like this phrase in, in, uh, in Pali, it's yata bhutan janati pasati. So, to know and see things as they really are, that's the yata bhutan part. In reality, how they are in reality or truly. So this is a kind of direct knowing that the path conduces to. Right? So things as they really are is always there, has always been there, will always be there. That's the good news, bad news of Buddhism. It's right there, it's right here. And yet, it feels very obscure, very difficult to touch into sometimes. So I'm going to give you an example of what we mean by this kind of direct knowing. So um, when I was living in Japan, I was living in a, in a monastery uh, on the back side of uh, the main island, so about an hour and 15 minutes on the train northwest of Kyoto in a little town called Obama. <laughs> yes, I thought that, you know, if I'm 5,000 miles away, I could be away from American politics, but no. Because <laughs> they were very excited 
that the then presidential candidate's name was the same as the name of the town. So you, I would go into the grocery store occasionally to get a little treat or something I needed, and they'd have these little cakes with a caricature of Obama's face <laughs> at the grocery store. <laughs> anyway, it's very funny. But um, <laughs> the town of Obama is a very cute little place. It's a fishing village, a small, relatively small fishing village on the, the um, strait that runs between China, Korea, and Japan. Cold part, the cold part of Japan, because the, the wind comes down off the Siberian Peninsula right across that strait right there. It's very snowy in the winter. But this wasn't winter, this was summer. I'm getting off track here. It was, the story goes, it was, it was the summer, and the summer like East Coast summer, really super hot, humid, wet summer. Really sticky. And, um, and so the folks that ran the monastery in their great beneficence had given us all a fan, a little, a little handheld fan, to uh, comfort ourselves in the hot summer because when you live in Japan, the monasteries are all um, you know, made in traditional style. It means you, you have literally like rice paper doors and, um, and tatami grass mats on the floors and no furniture other than a desk like this, maybe half this size, and some cushions. Um, so we had, we had the fan, because there's gonna, not going to be any, any big overhead fans or air conditioning or anything. And we were making do, all right, fine. And some of the monks went off, some of the senior monks went off to a big meeting with the, the um, Soto Shu, the uh, organization that administers um, Zen Buddhism in Japan registers, monks, and things like that. And they came back and they wanted to tell us about what had happened at the meeting. So there's a, so they called a meeting at our monastery in the evening. It's going to be in this little room off the kitchen, and everybody's going to come together and hear about what happened at that meeting. Now mind you that my Japanese is awful, awful. Skoshi dake yo, very little. I only know a little. Like maybe five verbs you need to have in the monastery to really to get by, like sit, sleep, sweep, cook, you know. That's, <laughs> what, that's, what, I know. that's what I know how to say in Japanese. You know? so, um, so I knew I wasn't going to understand much of this meeting, and the translators, you know, they're not going to translate something like that unless there's something that particularly pertains to me. The, translators, the interpreters are not going to be doing the interpretation. So fine, so we're going to this meeting, so I put my fan on my desk so that I can remember to bring the fan with me, because we're all going to be sitting indoors in this room under these fluorescent lights, and it's going to be kind of hot and sticky. And when I put the fan on the desk, so the fan is like an oval-shaped thing, like about this. It has a little white plastic rim around it, and it's blue on both sides, nice royal blue color. And I put the fan on the desk, and it has these little dots, these like seemingly random little dots on it. White dots. And when I put it down, I looked at it for a second and I noticed, oh my gosh, this is a map of the night sky. These little white dots. These are not just random dots. This is a, this is a map of the constellations on this fan. And I thought, how ironic is that? We do what humans do, which is instead of going out and sitting outdoors under the beautiful night sky and the constellations, we're going to sit indoors with our little copy of it. <laughs> <laughs> and hope for the best, you know, make the best of it. With our concept of the night sky, instead of being out under. So know that when you do that in your life, see if you can be aware of when you do that in your life. When you choose the artificial instead of the natural. When you choose the concept of a thing instead of the thing itself. So anyway, so then the meeting kind of starts. So we go to the meeting. And you know, it's kind of like in those Charlie Brown movies, right? Some of you, this is an American cultural reference. Maybe some of you will, re will, will recognize it, that 
the teacher always sounds like this, wah, 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 wah. You cannot make out anything that's being said. It's kind of like that. We're sitting there in the meeting, and that's what it's like for me. Like, it's a Charlie Brown meeting. And I'm sitting next to my fellow monk. <laughs> I'm sitting next to my fellow monk, Ryudo. Ryudo is his name. It means Dragon Way, which I always thought was very interesting. He's a little guy who's like Tadere. He was a farmer before he was a monastic, literally a rice farmer in Japan. Very happy guy, like one of the most cheerful guys in the whole monastery. But his name is Dragon Wei. <laughs> All right, Rudo-san. So Rudo-san is sitting here next to me, and he's got his fan too. And so it's hot. I'm sitting there. I'm not really listening at all. And I'm just kind of looking down and sweating and not even using my fan, just kind of melting there in my seat. And I look over, and what happens? Rudo is using his fan, right? So in one moment, he flicks his fan, and it goes completely white, the face of the fan. It just completely goes white. And I was stopped in my tracks. I was completely taken back. And then he flicks it again. And then it's back to the image of the night sky. And then flicks it again. And it's completely white again. Aha. So in that moment, there was this kind of seeing something for me. How I would never have guessed that, that in that moment that this thing could go completely beyond the concept of fan and completely beyond the concept of night sky and manifest how it is merely a set of conditions from moment to moment. And it's luminosity. It's, it's going, it goes beyond this fixed function that we think it has. So our mind is like that too. So this was not exactly a pure direct knowing because there was still a sense in me of an observer and a thing observed. It was a momentary kind of experience of it that was closer, it was a little more intimate than usual. The ones where there isn't an experience of observer and thing observed are a little bit harder to talk about. But to say there, there is this, um, this way in which we can become fully absorbed. So I didn't, get, I didn't finish talking about the other two kinds of samadhi. So there's the samadhi of flow, and then there's the samadhi which is more directly engaged, concentrated on one particular object. And then there is a samadhi of full absorption, where the sense of separation between the observer and the observed is eliminated. So that's the kind of direct knowing that's possible. That will that that can shift your experience of the world. So to know and see things as they truly are is not some kind of magical trip. Nor is it by an act of will. So going back to the sutta, when that happens, when there is this Yata Bhutan Janani Janati Pasami. There is 
this way in which we become, and we do need to be careful with this language, disenchanted. So we're no longer enchanted, actually. We are no longer interested in grasping after the baubles, the shiny things. Because we understand at a much deeper level what's going on. And the fact that those things aren't ever going to make you happy. That the true kinds of joy we were just talking about there have nothing to do with any of those things. So the translation here is to become disillusioned. To allow the, de- the, the delusions, the illusions that we have about our lives, they drop away. So this is also important. You know, when we talk about letting go, I think sometimes there can be, especially if you're very eager, which is a good thing, there can be this um, confusion about how that happens. So it's not that we pry our delusions out of our closed fist. That's not how letting go happens. It's that we begin to open further and further to this reality, these truths. And by seeing that, then we can with ease let go. It's just no longer that interesting. So don't do harm to yourself on the path in the name of letting go. That's not how it works. If you find yourself entangled, then be with that entanglement. Study it, understand it, feel it in the body, see it in your mind. The Buddha went through this himself. You know, he talks about that Sometimes with unwholesome thoughts, he would, he says, clench his teeth and bear down and hold his mind down like a strong person would hold down a weaker person. And he says, that's only in emergencies. (laughs) Don't do that. Generally speaking, not a good strategy. Repression is not, not good. It's not helpful. That's not what we're talking about. But there can be, as a result of us seeing how things really work, there can be this kind of disenchantment in the positive sense of that, disenchanted or disillusioned. And then from that comes dispassion also, comes again this kind of letting go of uh, a pursuit of different kinds of things that will only temporarily make you feel better. And really seeing the essential instead of pursuing the inessential, really pursuing what's essential. And then finally, after all that, so that's not the final step, mind you. Actually, so the final step is the knowledge of freedom, the knowledge and vision of freedom, seen for oneself. So there's a reflective quality. So this goes back a little bit to what I was saying before about when there, when these, some many of these kind of um, deeper insights can happen, and there's a sense of reducing or eliminating the sense of separation, the sense of a self that's observing, that's experiencing this thing, then it's only in hindsight, it's only in later reflection that you can see what happened. And in fact, the Buddha said, has, says many times in the sutras, 
it's very important to reflect on what has been set down, on what has been let go of, on what has been relinquished. Because we do have to get above the cushion. Because we do go on engaging with our lives. And so we consolidate that clarity by having a good look at what are the things that we've let go of. So knowing that you're free of being pushed and pulled by the things of the world which are not actually all that valuable. So it's a path, just to remind you again, if you have any confidence at all in the Buddha, as somebody who had a special insight, a special uh, uh, unique experience of the world, if you have any confidence at all in a different kinds of uh, teachers and their experience of the path, then you know that they do what they do or did what they did in the past, just like Wen Ang with his Dharma brother. They do what they do because they have rock solid confidence that each one of us has this capacity. I myself have been fortunate to run into a few teachers like that. who reassured me that I have this capacity to walk this way. So I want to reassure you all as well that you all have this capacity to walk this path. There's no question in my mind.